heading to uh, record, but um, we're now recording. And that re this recording will be available to you uh, after the event as it will on the Living Without Lust website um, shortly after. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for gathering us together. We thank you for this opportunity to learn about uh, intimacy, emotional connection, and how to uh, either build or rebuild um, this connection uh, with our wives and with our significant others. Uh, we ask that you would be present, Lord, as Michael speaks, and as we listen, we might understand the road to which you are calling this in this regard. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I want to introduce uh, Michael Regeer, it is pronounced Regeer, uh, to you. Uh, he is a clinical psychologist who specializes in working with couples who struggle with negative cycle arguments, emotional disconnection, and betrayal trauma. Michael has been uh, happily remarried for 10 years to Paula, who is his best friend and business partner. Paula has been married twice before meeting Michael. The couple discovered the science of attachment, which transformed the way they do relationship and how Michael practices couples therapy. Michael and Paula are passionate about spreading the word about what they now know about how to stay emotionally connected and prevent the problems each of them had in previous marriages. Michael and his wife Paula have written a book available on Amazon called Emotional Connection. This is a book Brian Hickox originally suggested, which I have read. And it's terrific because what it does, it takes the couple from the point of rupture when that trust has been broken all along the road of healing and connection and just shows what the different roadblocks, what the different struggles and pathways are uh, as they move along that road. And it is a road. It's not a couple of weeks or a month. It is a long road, but a productive road. Um, it is, um, is about a successful couple in a relationship trouble named Ben and Claire. Ben has an emotional affair that Claire discovers on his cell phone. And I think this is important for us to understand too. Um, I had a conversation with my son-in-law. He was visiting here and I was telling him about the book and he said, oh, it was just a text? As if the, uh, just a text means there's no break in trust. What I've come to realize is that whatever the secret life is, that is a rupture because the intimacy of a marriage is called uh, to be um, completely open and honest uh, about our activities. When we're doing activities secretly on the side that can create uh, ruptures. Uh, and the book explains the science of how relationships heal by learning uh, to emotionally connect. So Michael, thank you for joining us. Um, we're so glad you're here. And Michael is joining us, by the way, from, I think you called it Mid Coast, California. Was that it? Central Coast, California. Central Coast, California. Okay. Yeah. 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 So um, let's begin. Um, Michael, your book, Emotional Connection. By the way, the book is available on the website, livingwithoutlust.com. It's also available to um, uh, on Amazon. Uh, it focuses on a man who's discovered by his wife to be texting another woman. So in the book, you describe a fairly long process of restoration and First question involves exactly what I just described is that a lot of men think of betrayal as only about sexual inf infidelity. In other words, either sexual um, contact with someone else or let's say an online, a salacious online relationship or something like that. Uh, why is it important to, to include porn use and secret activities like secret texting and online activities under the category of betrayal? And so in, in our book and in the work I do, it's, it's really based on something that we call attachment theory. And attachment happens when we bond with another human being. And that bond happens the first time between parent and child, either successfully or not successfully. And we'll talk a little more about that later. But then as adults, we're, we're biologically wired to pair bond with another human being. And that, that pair bonding is what we call emotional connection. It's this, it's this connected relationship. It's based on trust. And it has to do with the idea that if, 
if I'm in pain, if I have an emotional need, I know you're going to respond to that need and be there for me. So it's a really in intimate and intricate connection with another human being um, that we know now from science has a lot to do with our health on, on many different levels. When we're, when we're securely connected emotionally, we, we have less depression and anxiety, our immune systems work better, we make decisions better, we're more optimistic and outgoing in the world. When we're disconnected, especially when a bond that we thought we had becomes disconnected, injured, we develop this incredible fear. And often that, that fear can result in a form of post-traumatic stress disorder. So, you know, to answer your question, it's, it's so important that we're absolutely transparent with each other because the trust then allows us to be open with each other and to open our hearts, open our emotions, open our thoughts to each other. And that's what creates um, a secure relationship. So it really doesn't matter what the breach is. You know, people think, well, it was just, I, we intentionally wrote the book about an emotional rather than a sexual affair for that reason, because people tend to downplay emotional affairs. But think about it, you know, if, if you've married somebody and you've, you've said you, you belong to me and now I'm gonna share kids with you, I'm gonna share finances with you, I'm gonna share a life with you. And then you see on your partner's phone that in this case, she, if we're talking about it in the other direction, is, is emotionally giving her heart to somebody else. There doesn't have to be any sex involved for that to be absolutely devastating and throw you into deep fear. So that's why, that's why that's so important. So um, we're living in the internet age. And of course the internet is all about quote, connection. Connections become a buzzword, but it's also put a lot more pressure on us because the availability of having alternate connections, online connections, secretive connections, even people have said, well, we need to meet offline as mm -hmm. if we're really meeting online. And now we need to meet face to face as if this was some, a novel thing. Yeah. Can you describe first of all the kind of pressures the internet is putting on us to um, live inauthentic uh, lives? Yeah. Well, I think that anything that we tell ourselves about uh, an internet connection being less real than a face-to-face -face connection is just pure deception. I mean, we, we connect online. I mean, my whole practice has gone online since COVID, which is remarkable. I do deep connected couples therapy through and on online relationships. So it, it really makes no difference at all, whether you're online or offline in terms of, of how you connect. And the pressure is that the world is marketing to your primitive brain all of the time through images, right? So you can be completely, you can be looking at camping equipment and, and get an image thrown at you to try to get you going in a different direction with your search, right? So there are a lot of pressures now that we didn't used to have before. And of course, social media and the, the kind of connections that we can make that are either healthy or unhealthy through that as well. So yeah, it's like we're living privately in public now when we didn't used to live that way. So let's begin with, um, you can either talk about the book or in any relationship where there's a discovery of a violation, there's a discovery of betrayal. Yeah. What does the betrayer need to know about what he needs to do, since we're dealing with men here, he needs to do in the early days where betrayal has been discovered? Yeah. So we, there's a good chance that when betrayal is discovered, it's going to cause betrayal trauma. And betrayal trauma, you know, can be full blown post traumatic stress disorder or a mild, milder variant of that. But, but often, you know, when people are in betrayal trauma, 
there's extreme fear, there, there can be panic reactions, hot and cold flashes, um, this sense of, of doom, of dread, of scanning the environment for danger, uh, of basically just being on edge and incredibly fearful. And then one of the things with PTSD is that there are triggers. So anything then that reminds the person of the traumatic event can trigger all of this emotion to come back up and all of this fear to come back up. So, um, you know, you said, what can they do shortly after? Well, shortly after, if, if you, if you created um, betrayal trauma in your partner, I highly recommend that you get into therapy so that your therapist can help you learn how to be present to your partner when your partner is triggered. And it's a long road back, you know, it's a long road back for your partner. Um, and I teach, um, if the men are the betrayers and the woman has been the betrayed, and it can work the other way too, but often it's that way. Um, I teach men how to be partners in their wives' healing and learning how to emotionally connect when your partner is triggered is, is the way out of that. Mm -hmm. And depending on the level of the trauma, um, it can take a couple of years to heal that injury. It's quite remarkable, but the, the flashbacks can come back, the triggers can come back, and um, there has to be continued reassurance every time the person is triggered. If you walk away, if you minimize it, if you say you're just being irrational, um, then that, that injury doesn't heal and it creates distance in the relationship, fear in the relationship, and ultimately can cause the relationship to, dest to destruct. Uh, I know that in my situation, focusing on um, my wife, uh, I'm working through a book called Helping Her Heal. Uh, I see it over there. I'm about halfway through it. And it relentlessly focuses on my wife's needs. And uh, it really it reveals to me how self-centered my thinking has been, been my entire life. Yeah. Um, this is a hard road. Mm -hmm. um, but getting back to the, to the betrayer, sometimes the betrayer, I can, my, my road was like this, can live in a period of helplessness and hopelessness thinking this never will be different. I will never be able to repair this. Yeah. And like a trip, there are perhaps different signposts along the way to that place where you really begin to create the emotional before you get the, where you can really create a positive emotional connection going forward. So in order to create hope for the addict who's been the betrayer, what are some of those signposts along that way to show that you're on the right track and moving toward a deeper intimacy? Yeah. So you're right, Jay. I hear this all the time. Like this is never going to heal. In fact, I just I was just working with um, with that yesterday in, in one of my clients. Um, we we want we want to confess. We want to do the big reveal and authentically confess and then we want it to go in and we want everything to be all right and what what guys don't get is that they can confess and um, their wives can actually forgive them um, at least intellectually but if there's an emotional injury there it's going to take a lot longer for that to heal and it, it requires um, the guy to continually reach toward his wife every time she's triggered or upset and reassure her. Now, the problem is that those reaches aren't always accepted. It's like you, she can be triggered. He can reach and say, I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I've hurt you. I'm here for you. And she can say, I don't believe you. Now, at that point, what the guy wants to do is say, this is hopeless. Look, I, you know, I, I, I've reached toward her, I've reassured her, and she tells me that she doesn't believe me. And he can say, well, my reach did no good. 
And when you really dig down deeper, what you find out is, no, the reach did some good. She actually appreciated the fact that he reached toward her, even though she wasn't ready to let him in. So that's, that's the path. And that's, that takes a lot of humility and courage to keep reaching. And then this crazy thing happens, all of a sudden, you know, she, she's afraid and he reaches and then it goes in and she actually feels it and she feels the sincerity and a spark of trust gets reignited in her and things begin to change. Um, but what are the signposts? Well, the signposts are, first of all, that you learn how to de-escalate the arguments um, by being non-defensive with your wife and being emotionally open with her and, and learning to support her so that you don't get in these negative cycle arguments where she puts her fear out and then you make up excuses and then that causes her to be more fearful and then she puts more fear out and, you, and then you go away and that causes her to feel abandoned. That's what we call, call a negative cycle argument. So the first signpost of healing is that you learn how to stay out of those negative cycle arguments. And that's our first goal in couples therapy always is to help couples navigate that, to see the triggers, for the guys to stop withdrawing, for there to be more transparency, more um, vulnerability in the conversation. And then, so that's where it starts. And then this, after you, you, you navigate that, we're looking for bonding events. So we're work, looking for deeper, more connected conversations where the words begin to go in. And the couple then starts to feel connected with each other. And then the third stage that we talk about is consolidation. You know, once, once you're rebonded, now you can figure out life together. Um, but you can't figure out life together very well until the, the bond of trust is, is restored. Hmm. Can you uh, steer us between the Scylla and Charybdis of, <laughs> if you know that term, um, of reassurance and defensiveness? Because I got those two mixed up for a long time. My wife would say something and then I would defend. Yeah. Uh, which to me sounded like an explanation of fact, but to her sounded like I was trying to uh, control her thinking or to, to get her off my trail or whatever it might be. And what I finally realized is that I had to really al allow her feelings to uh, penetrate me and for me to listen to them, even if the facts surrounding those feelings were wrong, even if she said, uh, I was afraid you were doing this or or uh, did you do that? And those are two things I had not done or ever thought of doing, but she was getting those feelings out. And I was responding to the facts in a defensive kind of way, instead of acknowledging the feelings. Yeah, and absolutely. for, yeah, those have been split, those of us who've been split off, that's a hard thing to learn, isn't it? Yeah, it really is. And that's such a great insight because we, I have, we work with that all the time. What, what guys don't understand is that um, for, their, for their wives to heal, you've got to care about her emotions. And it's exactly what you're saying, Jay, even if her emotions aren't completely factually accurate. So then the guy goes, well, why? If, if I, what they say all the time is, so if I, if I care about her emotions that aren't based in facts, if I care about them, then I'm going to be admitting that, that what she's feeling is true. And what I say is, no, you're not admitting to anything about the facts. What you're doing is you're showing compassion that she feels a certain way. So you, we've got to get off of this fact thing. You know, what, what guys want to do is they want to be like lawyers in a court of law and debate the facts. This has nothing to do with that. Um, we're, we're, not, we're, we're not in front of a judge. We're not in front of a jury. The facts don't matter. If, if she's in pain, pain is pain, whether it's emotional or physical. And when she's in pain, she wants to know that you care about her pain. And so 
being actually being able to feel her pain is the way we care about it. So feeling that she's hurt and then from a place of feeling that hurt, communicating to her that you are so sorry that she has been hurt so bad, that's the way to go rather than getting into a debate about the facts. If you were to sit before a couple as a therapist did once with my wife and me and ask, you know, if do you want to have the marriage restored? And we both said, yes, we did. Mm -hmm. um, what are some of the things that make it, uh, other than the, the empathy that we're talking about and the listening, that make it more likely that a marriage can be saved after uh, some kind of sexual or uh, emotional betrayal like this? What are the things that uh, indicate to you that yes, um, a marriage could be saved or maybe that it couldn't be saved? Yeah. Well, I think kind of like you were, you were suggesting, you know, a realistic understanding of the road back, right? And it, it's going to take time. So that I'm always asked, well, like, how long is this going to take? So therapy is going to take um, as much time as needed to repair the attachment bond. And what makes that complicated is that often where there's sexual acting out, there's also what we call developmental trauma. Somebody has been abused when they were kids and there's unhealed trauma from, from growing up, which, which creates even more trust problems. So where there's developmental trauma, it takes even longer to create trust, especially, you know, when there's then trust betrayal in the marriage, right? So the, the way back is, I usually tell people, you know, where there's actual trauma, it's probably one to four years of, of working on um, learning how not to be defensive, how to stay out of the negative cycle, and how to have bonding conversations and to be reassuring. And to be there when your wife is triggered. One story I tell about in uh, a situation that I worked with was I had a couple that were um, pretty well known in the area. He did a lot of TV advertising and um, she discovered a, a really well known, she discovered that he was having an affair. Um, her sister told her about this Facebook feed that she found. And I, people are just kind of crazy thinking this stuff won't get discovered, but the interaction between them actually got published on Facebook. So the wife discovers this very intimate interaction, which actually included him getting ready to propose to her, right? So, and she knew nothing about any of this. So she was extremely traumatized to the extent that even driving on a freeway through the city that he had an affair in caused her to have a PTSD reaction. And um, he wanted to know what to do because they, they would drive from Central California, the valley to the coast and driving on this freeway was important. Otherwise they'd have to drive an extra hour to get get to their same destination without driving on this freeway. And I said, drive around it. Don't drive on this freeway until she gets more healed up. And a lot of guys would say that's extreme. Like she's, she's exaggerating. She's, but no, she wasn't exaggerating. It would be like a guy coming back from, from Iran that had um, an, uh, an explosive happened next to him and one of his friends killed and he had a PTSD reaction. And now he heard a car backfire and he was back in battle. I mean, it's that severe with these, with these reactions. So he began driving around that area and eventually she trusted him, she healed up and it got better. But it takes that kind of attention to your spouse's trauma reactions to heal and it does take time. Now, a number of us um, use various techniques uh, to uh, build emotional intimacy. And I find sometimes with us guys, it's good to have a kind of a discipline to do that. 
Uh, one of the things that my wife and I use, and you can see it online, is called FANOS. It's an acronym, F-A-N-O-S. And um, it allows you to spend a few minutes, however often you like, where you're really listening deeply to each other. Um, this format does not allow you to rebut anything that your spouse has said uh, in terms of feelings, but you take them in, you listen to them, um, and you each get a chance to go through some things. And part of it is that the addict gets to say how they're doing, generally speaking, in their recovery yeah. uh, and in their sobriety. Uh, and it's very helpful um, for, for couples that may just be beginning this process. Michael, do you have suggestions as to what kind of uh, uh, formats or um, exercises uh, they can use? Yeah, I really like Thanos and I've got a number of um, clients that I've seen couples that, that use it. I think it's great. I'm just reminded as you're bringing it up that I probably need to be recommending it more often because I, yeah, I think it has all the stuff in it that, that we need to keep, you know, when you're talking about feelings, affirmation, needs, owning your stuff and kind of talking about your spiritual growth path, all those things are just kind of the big picture of what we need to be talking about. So, so that's good. And, and any, any, um, any variant of that that we can make time for the process in real time. And the big problem, um, Jay, with couples is what I call parallel lives. And I work with so many successful couples. I, I think I have three couples now that are both physicians. We live in a very different world where we have very high powered men and women working together, you know, couples where they're both in business. I have Silicon Valley couples where, you know, they're working for tech firms and really on the run and very busy. And, you know, one of the biggest challenges is making time for relationship. And people don't get it, you know, relationships take time, they take process, they take, um, they take reassurance. They take letting each other into your worlds. So Thanos is great, but like to really do Thanos or anything like that, um, there has to be time set aside to just have a cup of coffee and process. And, you know, couples that have high powered professions, especially when kids are at home, they have a hard time making the time sacrifice to be with each other. But if they don't, the relationship does not have a future. I, I can guarantee you it's going to die. And that's what basically happened in my first marriage, married to a physician um, who was very busy. Um, and we lived parallel. And I had my career and she had hers. And yeah, we had great dinners. We went to romantic islands to vacation with no connection. And eventually, you can only do that so long and the relationship will not survive. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about emotional connection because this seems to be a real understanding that this is the bridge. A lot of us did not grow up in families that shared feelings. And so, and, and as men, um, my favorite joke is when a, one man asks another man, how are you feeling? He says, I'm a guy, I have no idea. Um, and um, so we come in this into marriages kind of crippled. Um, why is it that the emotional connection rather than let's say physical connection or social connection or mental connection or some other connection is the key? What makes it so important? Yeah, well, that's, that's the million dollar question. And so what I'd like to do is show you guys a two and a half minute video, which talks about what goes right and wrong in that early development, that early connection between mother and child and why emotional connection is so important. So I'd like to just share my screen with you guys and show you this. All right. Are you seeing that picture of that child? Yes, yes. 
see if I can move that. Hmm, not wanting to move. We can see it, so we can see it. Oh, yes. Yep. It here. Let me just do that. There we go. All right, let's take a look at this. Babies this young are extremely responsive to the emotions and the reactivity and the social interaction that they get from the world around them. This is something that we started studying. 30, 40 years ago, when people didn't think that infants could engage in social interaction. And they still face experiments, what the mother did was she sits down and she's playing with her baby who's about a year of age. And she gets a greeting to the baby, the baby gets a greeting back to her. This baby starts pointing at different places in the world and the mother's trying to engage her and play with her. They're working to coordinate their emotions and their intentions, what they want to do in the world. And that's really what the baby is using. Then we ask the mother to not respond to the baby. The baby very quickly picks up on this. And then she uses all of her abilities to try and get the mother back. She smiles at the mother. She points because she's used to the mother looking where she points. The baby puts both hands up in front of her and says, what's happening here? She makes that screechy sound at the mother, like, Come on, why aren't we doing this? Even in this two minutes when they don't get the normal reaction, they react with negative emotions, they turn away, they feel the stress of it, they actually lose control of their posture because of the stress that they're experiencing. It's a little like the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good is that normal stuff that goes on that we all do with our kids. The bad is when something bad happens, but the infant can overcome it. After all, when we stop the still face, the mother and the baby start to play again. The ugly is when you don't give the child any chance to get back to the good. There's no reparation and they're stuck in that really ugly situation. Babies this young. So what were you feeling, Jay, as I was showing you that? Oh, pain, yeah. pain, pain, oh gosh. Uh, I have a friend whose mother uh, was married to a very well-known uh, world traveling scientist and she left him when he was a year uh, when he was a baby for a year and I don't think he's ever yeah. overcome the anxiety from it and it just um, it, it's amazing uh, to see that uh, and how quickly that disconnection um, is registered in the baby yeah so just to kind of play that out a little bit so if if that mom would have stayed still faced, the baby would have protested and protested and would have gone one or two ways, would have become emotionally di dysregulated and anxious and unable to soothe. Or like many little boy babies do, it would have stopped protesting and turned inward and not made any more reaches and it looked like a little adult, even though it was a child. And we call that avoidant attachment. So the only language that child has to reach the mother is emotional language. It's coos and cries and um, laughs. That's the way that child stays connected with the mother. And it needs the mother to mirror back to it 
that it's the mother's paying attention, the mother sees its signals. Um, and when mothers don't do that, then kids turn inward and they, they, they either get very afraid or again, turn avoidant. So how all of this relates to pornography, and I'm gonna challenge you a little bit. Um, something you said, I hear this a lot, and I get it at one level, but as a couples therapist, it's something that I have to retrain my men on. You know, when you say, you've got to do your recovery just for you. You do, but sometimes what guys hear in that is that the recovery process is just for them, but the marriage therapy is for the relationship and somehow the relationship is different than them, you know? And none of us lives alone in a healthy way. And so recovery is about relationship restoration, you know, and, and wherever we're emotionally disconnected, we've got to repair that communication back and forth to be healthy human beings. If we don't, guess what? We're going to have this huge feeling of emptiness inside of ourselves. And then guess what? We're going to want to self-medicate with alcohol or porn or something else, right? To fill that emptiness. So at the bottom of every addiction is an emotional disconnection and a choice that that person makes to artificially fill that with some kind of substance, some kind of thing to make themselves feel better rather than reaching out for so that's why emotional connection is so important because it it fills that that attachment void that emptiness that loneliness on the inside so we don't need to go out and and seek a substance or you know whether it's sex or a substance to fill it up so that's why it's important yeah so we have about uh, five minutes before we're going to open it up uh, for questions. And if you do have a question, just use the chat function um, and you can uh, address your question uh, to everyone. We'll pick it up and uh, forward it on to Michael if you have a question on this uh, emotional connection issue. Um, so Michael, I guess my question is a lot of people who end up getting divorced and the, the, the spouse decides or they decide at some point that the marriage is not going to work and there's a divorce they can go on from that experience and say, well, I married the wrong person or um, it just, um, it was, you know, her, she had too many problems. Therefore, I'm gonna get married to somebody else and hopefully fix it. How can we avoid this kind of rebound syndrome where we're not dealing with our own stuff in this? And if we're single, I know some people on this call that are single uh, and have gotten divorced, um, better prepare ourselves for what may happen down the road with a possible additional um, intimate relationship. Yeah, so attachment works, attachment works. So you can leave one relationship, but if, if you haven't learned how to emotionally connect in that relationship, you're gonna have to learn how to do it in the next one. And, you know, recovery groups are good because the group work is the, the first step in learning how to be open and transparent with other human beings. But it's got to, it's got to transfer over into the pair bond. And um, so that's the work, you know, and sometimes it takes couples therapy to help you have those kinds of intimate conversations. Sometimes people who are intentional enough can, the couple can begin to do it on their own. If they're secure enough and intentional enough, and want, want to make those connections, they can do it as a couple, but it's gonna take a lot of intentionality and also realizing you know, that the dopamine deception gets everybody in new love relationships. So the new love relationship is gonna be incredibly um, stimulating. You're gonna feel open. You're gonna feel more emotional, more connected because in new love, you get a big rut surge of dopamine. The brain does that for you, but it, the brain shuts it off within about two years and you're back to your normal self. So then the hard work of attachment 
really begins at that point of learning how to be transparent and open and connected, but it's, it's a process. So we're into some questions now. Um, uh, Dave asks, I've, I'm an adopted child and I'm certain I have an attachment disorder. How can I overcome it to reach out to my wife? We are separated right now and she has her own PTSD issues above and beyond me. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a good question. So, you know, doing it, some of your own individual therapy can help. Um, there's something called somatic therapy, which teaches people to get in touch with their emotions, get in touch with what feel, you're feeling on the inside. Some people don't even know how to feel their emotions. So therapy can teach you how to feel and then talk about what you're feeling. And then when, when it's time for you and your wife to do some work as a couple, I highly recommend what, what I do. It's called emotionally focused therapy. And what we do in this therapy is we really track the emotional connection back and forth. And we, we help you learn how to make that connection um, by having emotionally connected conversations with each other. Mm. I'm going to unmute Dave and ask Dave to ask your second question. I'm having trouble getting down to it. So why don't, if you can unmute yourself, Dave, and go ahead and ask uh, Michael the question. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Um, I am also working on my step nine uh, in my 12 step program right now. And I just wondered if you had any advice as to how I might go about it uh, yeah. with, uh, in this situation. I mean, the kind of things I should concentrate on, what I shouldn't talk about. I mean, one of the things I've gathered that I should not spend a lot of time talking about is, you know, an attachment disorder and my problems and everything that I really should concentrate more on her feeling. Yeah. Um, but I just wanna make sure that when I do this, I do it right. Yeah. I think, yeah, coming out with um, how you've hurt her and being very specific about what you've done to hurt her and but really making it the focus on her, uh, her emotions and your awareness. And, and the more you can embody how you've hurt her. So it, it, it can't be just from your head. It's got to come through your emotions. So, you know, a lot of guys, they, they say all the right things, but they're, they're still faced. Their face tone doesn't show that they actually care. And they're, they have no voice modulation. So I always say that a bad confession is like bad acting, you know, like what makes a B movie? Brian can tell you that. It's when the actors aren't connected to their emotions. You, your wife will not believe you unless you're connected to your emotions. So you, you've really got to dig deep and find your compassion for her, for, for, that, for that to land for her. Um, interestingly, thanks for the question, Dave. Um, interestingly, my wife is an actor also. And one of the things she says about acting is that the actors are trying to get something from each other. That's what creates the intrigue and the tension and the, the love sometimes yeah. is, is they're trying to get something. Yeah. And so she was brought up in a, in a house. I was brought up in a house where no one ever argued. No one ever, they just stuffed everything. Her family, they, they went back and forth. And yeah. I was shocked when we got married that that was, I mean, their family actually threw things and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but she wants to know what's inside me exactly. and unless i bring it out unless i she understands and i'm able to articulate my convictions my hopes my dreams my desires my real ones um she, i'm not believable yeah. and i have to be able to bring that forward in order for there to be that connection that uh, that we're both looking for and i actually i agree with your your assessment that it is about relationship the only uh, difference I was making is that um, if there's non sobriety, then in that in itself is a, uh, a kind of uh, commitment to um, eroding the relationship. Oh, and, uh, until that's yeah. resolved, there can be no repair. So that has to be rock solid. Yep. Because yep. we get these if, if a breach happens if we're working on building attachment bonds and then she discovers 
that once more you are acting out, man, it just totally throws our work off track. So you're, you're absolutely right. The, the sobriety has to be rock solid. So guys, other questions, the floor is open. So this is your opportunity. We, we just go to the top of the hour um, um, and then we finish. So the, we have about 10 minutes if you want to ask Michael any additional questions. Um, so I'll give you, um, Stephen, uh, you'd like to ask a question. Go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question. Okay, uh, I appreciate all of your comments and uh, the emotional connection is ringing true with, in my marriage. Uh, when I have, part of the problem we have that is that for many years, uh, my wife has not had sex, no desire for physical intimacy. Yeah. And that's been a real problem. And therefore I've turned to internet pornography. I've had one extensive affair and uh, I'm a Christian and I know those are death, wages of sin is death. And, but uh, what can you do to suggest, I mean, reading your book perhaps will lead me close, but she won't yeah. see any counseling at all. And uh, so it's just up to me and I need help. Yeah, yeah, well, it's going to be tough without, I think, some therapy for you guys um, to change this dynamic. But I would say for guys that have been sex addicts, it's, it's really hard to make the shift from, um, from being sexually focused to relationship focused. Um, and, and I hear this all the time, like she won't have sex with me. And if I just get her to have sex, then everything's going to be okay. But what she's thinking is, how in the heck can I have sex with somebody I don't have a relationship with, right? And I don't trust you. And you're not showing me that you really love me, the person of me. So, you know, she's probably been traumatized somewhere else in her life. And so she's, she's shut down. So for her to heal that whatever that sexual injury is for her, she's got to be so trusting of you that you can, you can follow her emotional cues and that if she's afraid when you guys are, are starting to learn how to have sex, you'll slow down, that you'll reassure her, that, that you'll be able to get in sync with her cues. And, and that's the relationship work that's going to have to come before her sexual injury is healed and she can begin to open up with you. And emotionally focused therapy can help a lot with that if she would agree to get in therapy with you. Um, if not, then I would say just doing your individual work and showing her over time that, that she can trust you, being sensitive with her. And then therapists do something called sexual reintegration work, which is just real slow work of holding hands, holding each other, just holding each other in bed with no sexual demand, lots of affirmation, lots of, lots of encouragement. And you take it very slowly, kind of one step at a time before you actually have intercourse. And that's usually the healing path for this. I will certainly echo that myself and that when my wife and I do Phanos, we hold hands um, and that is a, a a tremendously uh, powerful thing. I want to ask you about humility because as I read um, a lot of the AA literature, and of course, a lot of addicts are egomaniacs. We're self-centered. We don't even know it. And he talks a lot in that book about humility because I have the same personality as Bill W. And so when I read his stuff, he was in the stockbroker. I was a stockbroker. You know, uh, there's a lot of things that ring true. And of course, our essay literature all is from AA, um, as David mentioned, a step work. So I think my wife wants to see that there's room in her life for me. Mm -hmm. And part of that is humility expressed in not being overly busy. You mentioned parallel lives in um, creating space for the two of us to be together to do things 
um, listening, be available, not always being preoccupied with uh, media or phones or stuff like that. Um, can you speak to that, um, how we create room in our lives for our significant other? Yeah, I think humility starts with, with dealing with your own self-deception. Um, there's a guy that I referred to over here for sexual addictions were, um, his name is Mark McKinney. And um, he actually um, does lie detector tests with the guys early in his assessment pro process to get them to be completely honest with themselves because so many guys actually lie to themselves about their acting out. So that sounds kind of extreme, but it's been actually kind of interesting to watch them come into my practice and to see how facing their self-deception helps with their humility. So that's number one, you've gotta be just dead honest with yourself and with your partner. But then I would say the second thing is learning how to be present, you know? Uh, how, when my wife is talking, am I being present to her? Am I looking her in the eyes? Am I really listening? Or am I solving a problem in my head? Am I, am I wanting to kind of look at my calendar on the phone while she's talking to me and act like I'm listening to her? but our wives are incredibly sensitive to whether we're being present to them or not. So that's really the key is we've got to be present. Mm. Last chance for any question. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. Um, if anybody has a burning desire, as we say in the meetings to, to ask Michael a question, um, now's your chance. Well, Michael, we thank you so much for joining us. This has been a great hour together. Um, this is recorded. You guys will all get the recording. Um, I hope you'll consider joining us again, but this emotionally focused therapy is really um, powerful. Um, I would suggest that you get the book and read it because um, if you're in a situation of uh, restoration, it does give you an idea of what the path looks like. Uh, there is hope. There is help. There is progress. When I first uh, disclosed to my wife um, and then it shocked her world, um, somebody said she's going to be angry for six months. And there's not the darn thing you can do about it. And that really helped me because I realized that God's timetable was very different than mine. I wanted to be fixed in a week or two, hopefully, hopefully by next Tuesday, you know, that's yeah. I wanted to hold, have the relationship fixed by then. And I was very clear that it was a long road and I needed hope. And if you read Emotional Connection by Michael Regeer, you will see what the path of hope begins to look like. So Michael, thank you very much uh, to the rest of you. I hope you have a wonderful weekend. We'll gather here uh, next Friday. Uh, if you're on our email list at livingwithoutlust.com, um, you'll get all the information about next week's program. If I was really prepared, I probably would be able to tell you who that is, but um, I believe it's Eddie Caparucci, if I'm not mistaken, our therapist from Atlanta, who will be talking about um, uh, some other issues in recovery. So again, thank you, Michael. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we will talk to you later. Have a great weekend. Say hi to Paul. Yeah. Say hi to Paul for me. Yeah. I will, Brian. I'll say hi to Great seeing you. Good. Good seeing you guys. God bless everybody.